This man is one of New York's most notorious car thieves, but his specialty was what set him apart. He didn't bother with stealing whole vehicles. Instead, he masterminded the extraction of specific auto parts, one so unusual and unexpected that car owners might not even notice them missing at first. This man didn't work alone for long. His unique expertise gave rise to a syndicate. One of the biggest crimes that committed in the century. And incredibly intelligent. A band of thieves, each specializing in the same niche trade. Together, they orchestrated a grand operation, which grew into a sprawling organized network. Their takings? An astonishing fortune that soared to $60 million. But this wasn't just a story of accumulating wealth. It was a story of ascension. With his amassed riches, this man paved a path to the zenith of the mafia hierarchy, commanding respect and fear in a world where both were hard-earned currencies. His journey began with nothing, a self-made magnet in the most perilous of arenas. A man with acute intelligence and razor-sharp observational skills carved out a place for himself in the ruthless world of organized crime. So who is this man? And how did he become the phantom king of car thieves? Stay tuned to uncover the rise of New York's stealthiest car thief. Our story unfolds in the 1990s, a time when New York City was grappling with a significant car theft problem. In a previous video, we saw the story of a Chinese intelligence officer who became America's most prominent car thief, specifically in New York. However, he wasn't the only one in the game. This story happened five years before the Chinese thief's saga. In the Nenities, New York was plagued by gangs and criminal organizations whose primary business revolved around cars. In just one year, over 150,000 cars were stolen in the city. These thefts varied. Sometimes entire cars vanished, and other times, thieves dismantled vehicles for specific parts, focusing on the more expensive ones. But there was one valuable part overlooked by the thieves, who failed to recognize its worth. Enter Maurizio Percan, a man destined to unearth the secret value of this neglected piece. Maurizio, of Italian descent, came from a family that immigrated to America in search of a better life. As we know, Italian immigrants in America often had their names tied to some of the most infamous mafia and organized crime groups. Growing up, Maurizio was steeped in mafia community life, which, like any other, had its hierarchy. At the bottom were the grunts doing the dirty work, like theft, looting, kidnapping, and even murder. Then there were the mid-level bosses, some of whom posed as legitimate businessmen. And at the top were the big bosses, the ones in control. In this stratified world of organized crime, everyone aimed higher, striving to rise from the underworld's depths. Maurizio started at rock bottom. His family was poor, with no connections or help to offer. He had to build himself from scratch, starting with the dirty work, stealing, looting, and selling his spoils to higher-ups. All the while, he kept a keen eye on the market, figuring out what was in demand and easiest to flip. Maurizio networked with the children of trade bosses to learn the ins and outs of the business. Finally, he chose to focus on car parts, sensing both profitability and a match for his skills. Once he gained the necessary experience and knew how the business worked, he aimed for the trader class, buying stolen car parts from thieves. He began to understand which parts were in highest demand and offered the greatest profit margins, even selling parts right out of the trunk of his car in his early days. He turned his vehicle into a mobile shop where car parts, acquired for a fraction of their worth, were sold at a steep markup. This wasn't just profit. It was a revolution in the underworld, setting the stage for what was to come. By 1994, with the streets of New York as his proving ground, Maurizio had amassed enough capital to take a pivotal leap. He opened a storefront, a move that wasn't just about expanding his business but legitimizing it. This shop served as a front, blending stolen parts with legitimate ones, creating a facade so convincing that it could withstand the scrutiny of law enforcement. He meticulously managed this dual inventory, ensuring that anyone who peered inside would see nothing but a legitimate business. 
Behind this legal veneer, Maurizio navigated the treacherous waters of New York's criminal underworld. He understood that to thrive, he had to engage with the city's mafia networks, offering payments to ensure his business operated smoothly, free from interference. As Maurizio fortified his front and secured his operations from the pressures of the criminal hierarchy, his empire began to flourish. His shop became the cornerstone of an ever-expanding network, one that would eventually stretch beyond the confines of New York City. Maurizio knew the rules of the game all too well. To keep his burgeoning car parts empire running smoothly in the underbelly of New York's crime world, he made it a point to stay on good terms with those above him. Regular payments to the Mafia weren't just a cost of doing business. They were his insurance policy. His business thrived under this arrangement. He forged stronger ties with the petty thieves who supplied him, always on the lookout for the most valuable parts with the highest profit margins. Then one day, his keen eye spotted a game changer, a piece that would catapult him from a mere trader to an esteemed figure among the criminal elite. It was the airbag, a part designed to save lives in accidents, but for Maurizio, it was the key to unlocking unimaginable wealth. He discovered that airbags were not only precious, but also incredibly easy to steal. A thief could remove one in less than a minute, and due to their compact size, they could be easily concealed and transported in large quantities. This revelation set Maurizio on a new path, turning his focus to accumulating airbags, a commodity in high demand yet easily overlooked. Maurizio was a visionary in the criminal world, understanding that in a scenario where 30 cars were lined up, he could strip them of their airbags in less than half an hour, a feat unparalleled when compared to the cumbersome task of stealing whole cars or larger parts. This efficiency was crucial, but what made airbags the perfect target was their difficulty to trace. At the time, airbags lacked serial numbers, making them nearly impossible to track once stolen. Their small size made concealment and storage a breeze, and critically, their value was astronomical. An airbag could fetch anywhere from one to $2,000, sometimes even more. Considering the value of money back then, airbags represented a golden opportunity for someone like Maurizio to amass a fortune. But there was an additional, unforeseen advantage to focusing on airbags, one even Maurizio hadn't initially accounted for, which would propel his business to stratospheric heights. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Maurizio first dedicated himself to understanding everything about airbags, their types, how they were assembled, and how they were disassembled. He then formed a specialized group of thieves, handpicking the best from his extensive network of petty criminals. These select few were trained to remove airbags quickly and professionally, streamlining the operation and ensuring a steady flow of merchandise to Maurizio's shop. Maurizio knew right from the start that his airbag business would skyrocket. The volume his crew could procure was massive, and demand was incessantly high. His clientele primarily consisted of mechanics and auto repair shop owners, creating a swift and efficient supply chain where stolen airbags would quickly find their way into cars in need of repair. Maurizio knew right from the start that his airbag business would skyrocket. The volume his crew could procure was massive, and demand was incessantly high. His clientele primarily consisted of mechanics and auto repair shop owners, creating a swift and efficient supply chain where stolen airbags would quickly find their way into cars in need of repair. Maurizio treated his thieves well, paying them generously, because he knew their loyalty was directly tied to the cash he handed out. Yet despite the high costs of labor, his profit margins were through the roof. Each airbag would cost him around $200, and he would then sell it for $1,000 to $2,000, sometimes even more. But these operations caught the attention of the New York Police Department as reports of airbag thefts began to surge. The police were initially puzzled by this new trend. They'd arrive at the scene to find the cars intact, minus their airbags, wondering what was happening. However, it didn't take long for the authorities to piece the puzzle together. The lack of serial numbers on airbags made tracking them impossible. Their small size and the speed at which they could be stolen made catching the thieves in the act equally difficult. 
Once the police realized the high value of these airbags, the situation became clear. They understood there was an organized operation behind these thefts, but even when they managed to catch some of the thieves, none would confess or implicate Maurizio. When questioned about who they worked for or who was paying them, they'd insist on working alone, shouldering all the blame themselves. This tactic meant they faced only minor charges, spending a few hours in jail before being released upon paying fines and compensation. The lack of severe penalties did little to deter the thieves or compel them to reveal the mastermind behind the operation. As a result, airbag thefts continued to plague New York City, with thousands being stolen each year. The problem became widespread, and the police were left scrambling, unable to trace the source or the brains behind the operation. Maurizio's empire of stolen airbags flourished under the radar, growing more robust and more extensive every day, as the city struggled to combat this escalating issue. On the other side of his rapidly expanding empire, Maurizio was living his dream to the fullest. His team was stealing so many airbags that he soon ran out of places to store them. That's when he decided to open a large shop and workshop called All in One. This workshop wasn't just any establishment, it was a massive warehouse. Part of it served as a storage area for the stolen goods, while the rest was transformed into a bustling workshop. Instead of merely selling airbags to mechanics and repair shops, Maurizio started replacing them for customers directly or selling them outright, significantly boosting his profits. He even launched a nationwide shipping service. Maurizio didn't stop there. He began advertising his company, branding himself as the Airbag King. He placed ads in magazines, newspapers, and even on the early internet. This marketing blitz propelled his business to new heights, with cash flowing in by the millions. Soon, Maurizio found himself with more cash than he knew what to do with. But with great wealth came new fears, particularly of financial audits. The thought of authorities scrutinizing his income sources and the massive influx of money worried him. To avoid any trouble, Maurizio decided it was time to find a skilled accountant who could manage his financial records and make everything appear legitimate. A crucial aspect of organized crime. Enter Eileen, a friend from Maurizio's high school days. Eileen was an experienced accountant. Maurizio told her he owned a company specializing in car parts sales and wanted her on board as the accountant. When Eileen first looked at the financial records, she immediately sensed something was off. This business was far from clean. Sensing her realization, Maurizio came clean, confessing the true nature of his operations. He explained that all he needed from her was to adjust the records and ensure all financial transactions appeared legal and legitimate. Eileen was hesitant at first, but the attractive salary Maurizio offered eventually swayed her decision. One of her initial pieces of advice was to start making payments via checks as they lend a greater sense of legitimacy to the business and its transactions. Heeding her advice, Maurizio contracted a check payment company and began paying everyone, employees and thieves alike, with checks. This method meant that the cash flow, once directly linked to Maurizio's company, now seemingly passed through the check company, giving the operation a veneer of legality. With the business aspect looking more legitimate, Maurizio decided it was time to distance himself from the dirtier side of operations. Previously, he had been directly involved in managing the thieves working for him. He chose to promote three of his most trusted thieves to act as lieutenants, managing the rest of the crew and overseeing all theft operations. This move allowed Maurizio to step back, isolating himself further from the day-to-day -day criminal activities. This restructuring made the business not only financially sound but also highly efficient and well-managed. Imagine a scenario where a specific airbag request comes in, and that model is unavailable in the inventory. Maurizio's team could steal the required airbag that very day, offering a turnaround time of less than 24 hours, a service even faster than official dealerships. Maurizio had effectively monopolized the airbag market. It was a bizarre reality where your car's airbag could be stolen at night, only for you to replace it at Maurizio's workshop the next morning. 
This additional feature was the cherry on top of Maurizio's already flourishing empire, setting him apart in the underworld of organized crime. Maurizio himself never fully anticipated the problem. He was creating and simultaneously solving. His mastery over supply and demand had become his playground, orchestrating thefts and sales as if he had tapped into an endless cash flow. Imagine that, amidst the staggering success of his company, Maurizio won an award named Trader of the Year. To any outsider unaware of his clandestine activities, he epitomized the self-made, successful entrepreneur. The wealth Maurizio amassed elevated him to the ranks of the most affluent figures in New York's organized crime world. He indulged in luxurious homes and expensive cars, living a life of opulence. However, wealth alone wasn't enough for him. He sought respect and status, commodities that, in the Mafia world, were typically reserved for those born into prominent criminal families. Coming from a modest, impoverished background with no ties to Mafia leaders, Maurizio was an outsider to this world of inherited prestige. To achieve the status he desired, Maurizio needed to become part of a Mafia family a feat that seemed nearly impossible given his origins. That's when he met Carol Montana, the daughter of a mafia boss. Maurizio's interest in her wasn't purely romantic. Her status as the daughter of a boss was, in his eyes, her most attractive feature, making her the perfect partner for him. Maurizio made his move, winning Carol over with his charm and expressing his admiration for her. In truth, he saw her as his ticket to the respect and status he craved. Carol's father, already impressed by Maurizio's self-made success and his ability to carve out a formidable position in the criminal world on his own, quickly approved of their union. Maurizio and Carol's engagement marked the culmination of Maurizio's ambitions, wealth, a wife with the right connections, and the sought-after status within the Mafia hierarchy. He had seemingly achieved everything he had set out to do, securing his place in a world where his background would have otherwise left him on the periphery. In the volatile world of gangs and crime, Maurizio learned the hard way that even when life seems rosy, everything can turn dark in an instant. The police managed to arrest one of the thieves working for him. Unfortunately for Maurizio, this thief was caught not in the act of stealing an airbag but assaulting someone during a robbery, a crime severe enough to potentially ruin him. Desperate to get out of trouble, the thief was willing to do anything, including revealing information about the airbag empire to the police. In exchange for immunity from his charges, he spilled everything about Maurizio and his operations. Following the tip-off, a police surveillance team set up outside Maurizio's workshop. They immediately noticed individuals carrying large bags into the workshop and leaving empty-handed, confirming their suspicions about the stolen airbags. The police began preparing to raid the place. But Maurizio, always one step ahead, had taken his precautions. He had installed surveillance cameras around the workshop, covering every angle. He quickly noticed the unmarked police van parked nearby. His first move was to call his assistants and order a halt to the delivery of stolen parts to the workshop. Then, as the detectives attempted to tail him, Maurizio, ever vigilant, detected their pursuit. To confirm his suspicions, he executed a maneuver, turning right three times, a classic trick to identify a tail. This maneuver is perfect for revealing followers, since completing three right turns essentially takes you in a circle. If the car behind does the same, it's clear they're following you. The police, realizing Maurizio was onto them, understood he was now extremely cautious. In response, Maurizio instructed his assistants to hide the stolen airbags in a different location, outsmarting the law once again and keeping his criminal enterprise one step ahead of the authorities. The police, determined to crack Maurizio's operation, continued their investigations for months without managing to pin anything concrete on him. At one point, they even attempted a sting operation. They sent an undercover officer with an airbag to try and sell it to Maurizio. However, Maurizio immediately turned him away, refusing to buy. He never purchased from random individuals. He had his own network of thieves and wouldn't deal with outsiders. 
Despite repeated attempts to infiltrate his close-knit circle with an undercover thief, Maurizio's caution kept him safe. The investigations dragged on for a year and a half, with the police unable to catch him in the act. Then, in 1997, a significant change occurred. Honda, the Japanese car manufacturer, decided to start putting serial numbers on the airbags in their vehicles. This was an unprecedented move that promised to greatly aid police investigations. Now, if the police recovered a Honda airbag, they could trace it to see if it was a genuine spare part or stolen property. Investigators began focusing on Honda vehicles, compiling a list of serial numbers from stolen airbags and creating a special database for tracking. Armed with this new tool, the detectives turned their attention to Honda cars, documenting the serial numbers of any stolen airbags. They then reached out to Maurizio's company, all in one, sparking a new phase in their investigation. This development represented a turning point, potentially exposing Maurizio's illicit operations to the scrutiny they had managed to evade for so long. The police cleverly requested airbags for Honda models from which they had serial numbers due to recent thefts. When the airbags arrived, they were able to confirm that at least one was listed as stolen, marking the first significant breakthrough in the case after a year and a half of fruitless investigations. Still, they needed more substantial evidence before they could make a move against Maurizio and his crew. They wanted to ensure that the evidence they collected would completely dismantle this operation. After securing a court warrant, the police were granted permission to inspect parcels shipped by Maurizio's company across America. This secret inspection allowed them to open, examine, and then reseal the parcels, leaving no trace of tampering. This scrutiny revealed the vast number of airbags Maurizio's company was distributing, confirming many were indeed stolen. Yet not content with just this discovery, the investigators delved into the company's financial records. These led them to the check cashing service Maurizio used, which acted as a legitimate front for transactions involving both his employees and the thieves, who were registered as company workers. Unbeknownst to Maurizio, the check cashing service documented every transaction, capturing the check and the recipient's face with a camera at the counter. Thus, every one of Maurizio's thieves and employees who cashed checks were recorded, unwittingly providing the police with concrete evidence of their involvement. Maurizio's attempt to legitimize his business dealings through the use of the check cashing service ultimately backfired. The photographic evidence and recorded transactions conclusively proved his direct dealings with the criminals. This strategic misstep not only jeopardized Maurizio, but also his entire operation, turning his effort to appear more legitimate into the very thing that brought his criminal empire crashing down. Finally, after 18 months of tireless investigation, the detectives knew they had gathered all the evidence needed to proceed with an arrest. A police and detective squad arrived at Maurizio's residence, armed with a court-issued arrest warrant, authorizing them to break in and search the premises. Upon arrival, they breached the door and entered the house, only to find it eerily empty. This unexpected turn of events sparked fears that Maurizio might have been tipped off about the impending arrest, possibly fleeing the country by then. However, as they scored the house, they stumbled upon a table adorned with wedding gifts, quickly realizing these were for a recent wedding. Maurizio had just gotten married, and alongside the gifts was a guest list for the wedding party. This list wasn't just any list. It included names of well-known mafia bosses and figures in the organized crime world, some of whom were already on the police radar, as well as a few of the airbag thieves Maurizio employed, identified through the check cashing services records. Also listed were Maurizio's parents, complete with their contact numbers. Seizing the opportunity, the detectives decided to reach out to Maurizio's mother under the guise of an emergency, claiming that Maurizio's house had been broken into by thieves and that they urgently needed to contact him. Playing along, his mother revealed that Maurizio was currently on his honeymoon with his wife in Hawaii, providing them with the phone number he was using there. This new lead gave the investigators a direct line to Maurizio, potentially closing the net on him even as he was unaware, thousands of miles away on his honeymoon. 
The detectives made the call, informing Maurizio that his house had been burglarized. During the conversation, they were able to trace the phone number he was using, pinpointing his location to a resort on the island of Maui in Hawaii. Once his location was confirmed, they contacted the FBI office in Hawaii, requesting their assistance to apprehend him. The FBI agents moved quickly, identifying the resort where Maurizio was staying, determining his room number, and then storming the room to arrest him in the midst of his honeymoon. With that decisive action, Maurizio's airbag empire crumbled. Throughout the years of their operation, Maurizio and his gang were responsible for the theft of approximately 40,000 to 50,000 airbags, amassing a fortune estimated at $60 million for Maurizio alone. And as mentioned earlier, the value of money at the time made this fortune even more significant than it would be today. This marked the end of a sophisticated criminal operation that had thrived under the radar for years, showcasing the meticulous efforts of law enforcement to dismantle a network that exploited both the technological and operational gaps in automotive and legal systems. In the end, most of Maurizio's properties and his ill-gotten wealth were confiscated. Whether he had hidden some of his fortune in secret locations remains unknown. The court sentenced him to 10 years in prison on charges of money laundering and orchestrating thefts. Considering the scale of his operations, the sentence might seem lenient compared to others seen in similar cases. This lighter sentence could likely be attributed to the non-violent nature of his crimes. Unlike many criminal enterprises that involve armed robbery or physical harm, Maurizio's scheme focused on stealth and deception to procure and sell stolen airbags. This absence of violence and direct harm might have played a significant role in mitigating his punishment, reflecting the judicial system's nuanced approach to different types of criminal activities. And that brings us to the end of our story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit like, subscribe to the channel, and activate the notification bell. Until our next video, goodbye and take care.